Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to be wrapping up today's final talks, and I want to pick up on three main themes that we discussed throughout today's conference. The first is success and our perceptions of success. The second is finding sources of inspiration and motivation right around us. And the third is storytelling. And I've only just realized how much of my time I spend telling stories. I mean, every time I meet someone new, or I give an interview, or I have a talk like this, I'm essentially telling a story about who I am, about what I do, and in some sense, what I'm worth. And this actually just happened to you right before I stepped on stage. You were told a story about me in the form of a brief biography, right? And they started as most biographies do, Sarah's in so-and-so program, she does so-and-so things. Basically, this is why you should listen to Sarah, I hope so, for, for a given number of minutes. And we all engage in this sort of storytelling at some level, right? We tell stories to establish our credibility as people. We, tell, we sometimes tell stories to impress others with our successes. And this is true at some level, always, but this is especially true if you are part of the academic world. So what I really want to talk about today are the stories that get missed, the stories that we don't tell in academia, stories of challenge, of obstacle, and of failure. So where can we find these stories? Where can we find, like, I mean, where does academia publish their stories, right? We can look at research, we can see what gets published and what doesn't, but let's take a different approach. Let's think about the stories that we come across most frequently in academia. And when I asked myself this question, I came up with a few answers. So I thought about students who are honored for their academic performance. I'm a student, so that's the first thing I thought of. I thought about professors who receive prestigious grants or who are involved in groundbreaking research. I thought about university rankings, and especially if universities rank well. It seems like we tend to highlight and privilege success stories. And I want to be really clear, the problem isn't that we recognize the successes of the university and those within it. I think that the university should be proud of the successes that it cultivates. The real problem is that successes are all that we often recognize. So for example, the challenges that students face in achieving their strong grades, largely overlooked. The difficulties that professors face in their research is largely ignored. So in other words, we tend to only tell one part of the story. And when I think of stories, I think that they have two main parts. It's pretty obvious. Uh, we have the words that are strung into sentences that make up the content of the story. And then we have the punctuation that sort of separates these words from one another, these sentences from one another. And when I think of my personal narrative and my experiences in university, and outside of university, I like to think of words as my challenges, sort of the bulk of my narrative, what makes it possible. And I like to think of punctuation as my successes, those brief moments of reprieve and distinction. And so I started by saying that, you know, we sometimes tell stories to impress people. I'm not trying to impress you today. <laughs> I'm trying to be honest. And so to be honest, my university experience has been a lot of words. <laughs> When I think back on my four years, I think about four years of stress about my grades. I think about four years of figuring out how I was going to get over this mounting workload. And feeling almost this constant suffocating pressure to overcome things, whether it was tough grades or personal challenges or just difficulties in general. So for me, challenge was a big part of my narrative. It was part of who I was. But I just assumed that, you know, I was among the world's distinguished losers, you know, a special group of people, let me tell you. Um, and that, you know, this wasn't true of successful people, right? Their stories couldn't look like this. Their stories probably look like this, right? Sco <laughs> just scores of punctuation running across, across the screen. So, and I thought this way <laughs> for a really long time, you know? Um, until about two years ago on a GO bus ride. I always meet the most random and interesting people on the GO buses. <laughs> Um, and I wound up spending half an hour with one of my professors from first year on the GO bus. And for a lot of second year students, this sounds like a punishment. You know, what in the world <laughs> would I tell my professor for half an hour? Um, but I really liked this professor, and I, I remembered him as a great teacher and a fantastic researcher. But I was intimidated by him, and I couldn't help it. I remembered in my first year walking to one of his office hours 
only to find him, as most mathematicians do, writing feverishly about numbers and things that I couldn't even think about. So I just turned my back and I walked away. I was intimidated. Um, but on this bus ride, this completely changed. He shared with me his experiences and his process of finding his passions and the difficulties that he encountered along the way. But more than that, he provided me with such useful pieces of advice that they continue to inform most of the decisions that I make today. And then he told me something completely random about himself, that he writes romance novels. And then I thought, <laughs> you know, I can't be intimidated by this man. You know what I mean? <laughs> we have to be friends, right? Um, and so this person, this professor that I really looked up to and I admired, faced challenges. And I was intrigued. I thought, okay, maybe this is true of other successful people. And so I started this journey. I started to read the biographies of as many people as I could think of, from as many fields as I could think of, uh, to see their experiences. And I went from looking at Princess Diana <laughs> to Michael Jackson to John Forbes Nash, who most people will know as the mathematician from A Beautiful Mind, to pediatric neurosurgeon Benjamin Carson, and scores of other people, and I realized something. I realized that challenge and failure were at the forefront of their stories. Their stories had many more words than mine did, and they were punctuated with success. And as I became a senior student, professors started to share their experiences with me, just in passing, or because I asked, or whatever, and their stories were no different. And so now I'm in the midst of this dilemma, right? I'm like reading, I'm writing, I'm experiencing that challenge is so much a part of success stories. And yet all the stories I seem to come across in academia focus on these end point successes. And this is somewhat understandable when we think about the stresses that faculty and students are under, right? I mean, if we look at mental health rates, uh, anxiety, stress, and depression have skyrocketed across campuses. At McMaster, one in three students are estimated to have some form of depression at some point in undergrad, and nine in 10 report being overwhelmed. And so as we think about professional and graduate schools becoming more competitive, and for faculty, as research and tenure positions become more elusive, students and faculty are really driven to compete in academia's fierce rat race. And we feel, we sense, that nothing less than cut and dry success will suffice. So yeah, it's understandable, I get it. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be critical of the potential consequences of focusing on these end, pardon me, on these end stories. So there are two I quickly want to touch on. The first is that by focusing on these end stories, these final success stories, and sort of skipping the entire process in between, the process by which people become successful, students are left in a really awkward position. <laughs> students are in the midst of answering some of life's most difficult questions. Questions like, what are my passions? What do I want to do after I graduate? And can I really achieve my goals? And if we don't have any examples to draw on in our academic communities, answering this question becomes really difficult. So I was at uh, McMaster's Health Clinic a few days ago, and I was waiting for a doctor's appointment, as most of us do when we go to the doctor. <laughs> and, um, and I came across a quotation, which was really useful. It reads, it's good to have an end to journey toward, but it's the journey that matters in the end. It's the journey that matters in the end. So it sounds nice, right? Uh, in my second year, it would have made no sense to me. <laughs> in my second year, I hit this roadblock where I had no idea what I wanted to do after I graduate. I had no idea what I was passionate about, and I really didn't care about the journey. I just wanted to be successful. I wanted to figure out how I got to this end point. And and the, the thing is, is that students are in the process of answering such tough questions, but we're fearing things. I was terrified. I was terrified of having to conceive a different future for myself. I was terrified of having to take courses that I thought I would perform poorly in. Bottom line, I was afraid of failure, right? And I don't think that I'm alone in this fear. And that's really the second consequence, that students fear failure. So in the late 90s, The Independent published an article titled, Why Do Our Students Fear Failure More Than Death? And the article was drawing correlations between students' fear of failure and rising rates of suicide. And as mental health becomes a more prevalent concern across campuses in Canada, that correlation continues to be drawn. But even anecdotally, I mean, students in the audience, be honest, right? How many times have we 
Have we thought about taking bird courses? Or have our friends told us that they're gonna take bird courses? Or that we avoid certain professors because we're afraid of them? Or we avoid certain disciplines because we think we'll do badly in them? And this is an individual concern because students won't really push themselves to find what they're good at and what they love. But it's also a societal concern, right? If students are afraid of failure, then we'll be disinclined to push the limits, to start thinking creatively and innovatively about how we can approach solutions to pressing global challenges. And some of them were mentioned earlier. I mean, war, climate change, literacy around the world, access to medicines. I mean, these are issues that, we, that require that people think outside of the box. And yet we're preparing students to do the exact opposite. So we've spoken a little bit about academia's culture of success and potential consequences of this culture. So it's been pretty pessimistic. <laughs> Where do we go from here? How do we begin remedying this problem? How can we begin changing deeply ingrained cultural norms about what it means to be successful and what it means to be a failure? How can we begin telling stories that generally aren't told? And I think that there are a lot of different answers to this question, but the one that made a difference for me and the one that I want to touch on is mentorship. Because it was only when I heard the stories of those around me and my professors was I forced to think differently of challenge. And I was inspired to think of my challenges as opportunities. But it was sort of a, a painful inspiration. You know, it's difficult to embrace failure and challenge in an academic environment where those are the things to be avoided at all costs. But at the very least, I feared them less. And that was a really important start. So building those relationships between students and faculty is something that we need to consider deeply. And the research tells us two things. One is that increasing student and faculty interaction seems to improve students' rates of performance in school. And two, students seem to want this interaction. So there was a recent study published in Ontario that noted that one of the greatest disappointments for students is their lack of interaction with faculty members. And we have some work to do at McMaster. So a recent study that was published showed that only 23% of junior undergrads and 32% of senior undergrads interact with faculty outside of the classroom. And this is significantly less than the average that was noted of about 600 schools across the United States and Canada. So students want this interaction and this interaction has proven to be useful. But such avenues for dialogue don't really exist at university right now. But they can be made to exist, both inside and outside of the classroom, with professors bringing more of themselves and their research to their teaching. So for example, inside of the classroom, professors can maybe begin their classes with a quotation. Maybe they can end their semesters with some lessons from their experiences. Or outside of the classroom, they can make themselves more available to students to mentor them, and they can let them know that. But, and they can even just bring more of their research into the teaching that they do. But things can also happen at an administrative level. At an administrative level, we can begin organizing lecture series by professors, not necessarily about what they do, but how they came to do it. And we can organize similar things on smaller scales, sort of dialogues and cafes between professors and students. So there are so many ways that this idea can be manifested, which is, I think, a really uh, a key point about this idea. Though what really makes it contagious is that it's so flexible. So many people can take it in different ways, depending on a professor's preference, on the number of students in the classroom, the level of students. So this flexibility is important to consider. The second thing that's really important to consider is that every single institution of higher education in the world has the prerequisites that we need to implement this idea right now. We all have professors, we all have students, and we all have infrastructure. What we require, what we really need, is a shift in thinking, in thinking differently about including challenges in the stories that we tell. So these small changes can really act as the launching point for many larger goals of higher education. And there are two that I want to wrap up on. The first is challenging, uh, I guess, our definitions of these stagnant terms, such as success, failure, and challenge. And to begin thinking about them rather than, than being mutually exclusive categories, to being integral to one another. And the second, which really relates to the first, is that we really need to begin instituting change at higher administrative levels. Because I really think that students can only take so many steps towards challenging themselves before the university needs to take steps back towards us. 
We need to begin creating spaces where students can feel that they can challenge themselves and embrace failure without being afraid of their GPAs or their transcripts. And we need to begin removing these deterrents, these immediate deterrents, and providing incentives to allow students to think differently about challenge. And I want to conclude by saying this. None of what I've said today is meant to burden the already overburdened institutions of higher education. In fact, I hope it does the opposite. I hope that it shows that there's a body of knowledge and a reservoir of knowledge at, that exists at all universities that have largely been, that haven't been exploited by universities. The benefits of relationships, of lessons drawn from rich experiences, and of telling stories in all of their punctuation and their words. Thank you very much.